you, Lord, we come before you this afternoon in awe of you and your power and the intimacy with which you deal with us as a church and individuals. Lord, help us to have silence and peace and rest in our heart as we open it to your word, to the message that comes to you today. Pray for Matthew that he can have clarity of mind and thought and purpose as he communicates to us a message from your word. We love you and we pray in your son's name. Good evening, everybody. There's, uh, there's something special about the, I, I, I'd come together just to hear these song services. There's something about being here together and lifting our voices together to worship God that it means a lot to me. It's really beautiful. I, by way of beginning here, uh, I'm trying to, um, I told the church planters the last time I spoke that I was trying to keep my time down, so I'm going to try to be a little quicker. I'm wearing people out, so i try to speak a little quicker t- this evening. It's a little bit better when it's not so hot, but when it was hot over the summer, people were about to fall out. I want to, there's a, there's a couple of things, my, my own experiences as a preacher, there's a few different ways that, that, that I preach. There's a few different kind of like mm, travels that I take in my speaking. Sometimes I'm trying to answer questions. Sometimes I'm trying to ask questions. And I'm going to do a little bit of both today, tonight. What I want to talk about tonight, the title I have is uh, An Anarchist Rebel's Journey with Authority. Now, I don't like to define myself by my old life, but it is, where, it is the, the place where I begin. The place where I start looking at things is from where I came from. We all do that, right? Our, our, the place where we come from is kind of like the initial context to which we start to look at things. And, and a little bit about where I come from, there's a few pieces that are relevant to the issue of authority. Now, I grew up in a... Uh, middle class, upper middle class home in Southern California. My father was a businessman, a salesman. He was a very nice, normal person. But we had a bowling bag full of pistols and a closet full of rifles in, in my dad's room. And when I was a little boy and I'd ask my dad, why do we, what, what are all the guns for? He'd say, if the government ever tries to tell us to do something that they don't have a right to tell us, then we'll, we have means to stop them. There's something in the initial construct of all Americans, I think. It's built into our culture, this independence and kind of like the Western expansion that built the nation and these kind of like these virtues of our culture are all about self and self-reliance and self-direction and self. So I very much inherit that, that sensibility from my culture, from my family, from my nation, the place where I was born. And so then when I grew up, you know, I grew up a, a kid in the 90s and I, you know, in public school, I found my little niche, my little set of buddies and, and ended up me, meeting Erica and living on the streets and living our own way, very independent, very antisocial and suspicious of anything that told me what to do. Like even legitimate claims on me, I questioned. Um, the one, I have one indelible mark on my body. Uh, I have one tattoo, and it's an anti-police slogan, a, a hate slogan against the police. So this is the framework that I come from. Now, when, I, when I'm converted and I start reading the Bible, this stuff about authority is one of the first things that begins to pop out. And it's kind of, if I can give you a sense for where Eric and I were coming from, you know, when we, from where we were coming from, when we were first born again, 
Uh, I remember Erica one time, she was reading her Bible, and she was reading about, she, she had come across verses about pride. And she said, Matthew, it seems like the Bible talks about pride like it's a bad thing. I was like, yeah, it does. There was no framework for, uh, for her to think of pride as a bad thing. It was a virtue where we came from. You were supposed to be proud. You were supposed to be proud of yourself and proud of who you were and proud of what you were doing. Pride was a very, very noble thing. And we had to reorient our frameworks around the way that the Bible was talking about things instead of the way that we had come from. Another one of those categories that was early disruptive to me was how the Bible speaks about authority. I was coming from a place where, um, you know, these ideas that like libertarian notions, political notions about, you know, taxation is theft and the government has no right to tell us what to do and consent to the governed, these kinds of very American ideas about governance. And so, so reading things in the Bible like fear God, honor the king were completely alien statements. I didn't have any, I didn't have any way, any framework to, to begin that conversation. So I just had to start filtering through. There was a few there's a few things, before we look at some texts about authority, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you a couple of introductory ideas. One is that I think there are several domains of authority. There's, a few, there's at least three or four ways that we can think of domains or classes of authority. There's a, there's a domain of authority, maybe the biggest, at the biggest sense, there's a domain of authority that's just God's prerogative, where, you know, God, like Jesus has authority to forgive sins. Like nobody does that but God. No, he doesn't share that with anybody. It's the exclusive domain of God himself. Jesus is vindicating himself as Messiah by his power to forgive sins. Like that's a, that's a proof of his divinity is his capacity to forgive sins, something that only God can do. So there's a kind of authority that only belongs to God. It's, uh, we're not going to talk a lot about that because it doesn't have a lot to do with us, except for how we perceive it and understand it. But then when we get down out of, out of God's realm, there's three big overarching places where authority is a major concept of what's happening. One is in the world. This is Romans 13, and we'll look at that later. But how God has ordained ministers, authorities, in the world to keep the world in order. Another is the home. The home is different, very different than the world. Uh, and another is the church. God's society, God's family, and the world. Those are three domains of authority that are where authority has something to do with what God is doing in that realm. And I... I, I I'm afraid in even introducing this idea that some of us are already rolling our eyes because we've heard authority messages before. And, and this is very much my next point, is that what a lot of us bring to the table, and me first of all, when we talk about authority, is our experiences with abuse of authority. Now, if you, if you say the word police to me, I have a series of thoughts that jump into my mind. I think about being harassed, I think about being pulled out of cars, I think about being chased around, I think about the, the later examples of that in, in, in our own, you know, in the last few years, how there's been these horrendous abuses of authority with George Floyd and Eric Garner and on and on the list goes of people who are just literally killed by the authority in unrighteous, unholy, unjust ways. And when you say that word, I jump to all of those examples. It's my, it's my beginning point for discussing that domain of authority. And I know that many of my brothers and sisters, when I talk about authority, they have something similar that happens when they think about the bishops they've been around, the people they've been around, the people who have abused them in their social settings, or who have been unkind, uncharitable, and unchrist like And that's the initial thing that they think when you mention authority. They jump right to that conclusion. And what we all do when we're doing that, like, if I'm going to talk about 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 governing authorities, I, I'm starting that conversation from wanting to protect people. 
protect them from oppression. I'm not starting that conversation about what their utility is. You know, when you say that word police to me, all those things jump into my mind. You know what doesn't come first in my mind is when the police chief in Malden came running in my door and running up my stairs when my baby wasn't breathing. But that's just as real. Those kinds of events have been smaller in my experience and they aren't where I begin my framework. And I'm trying to learn over time, this, uh, some of this is coming up because I was, I was speaking with my family and friends, some friends last night about how this stuff has impacted my life and it, it, it brought a lot of this back to the surface and thinking about how am I growing and interacting with these things. They're, it's a place of my life that I know I have this I know I have this preset response and I know it's unhealthy and I'm trying to correct my worldview and correct my experiences. I was sharing a story of how when I lived here in Medford I was, I was dealing with some of these issues in my own life and I, I told Erica I was very much considering just pulling into the police station before they built the new police station here. Pulling into the police station and just going up to the front desk and saying, I have a big problem with police and I don't like that. Can, do you have like somebody I can have over for a barbecue? Like how, how do I make a friend with a policeman? I didn't do that. It didn't seem like a good approach. But, but I still think that way, right? Like I'm not happy with how my mind works in regards to that authority. And so I'm trying to push my mind and challenge myself and look at the other side of equations. And part of that is trying to understand at the root, like, why, why does authority exist? In any of its categories, why is authority there? Why do we need these structures? What good is it to have the police? What good is it to have, have a, a sense of authority in the home or in the church? What purpose do these things serve? And how do we know when they're healthy? And how do we know when they're unhealthy? What do we do when they're unhealthy? All of these are questions that we, that we can look to the scriptures for. I'm going to lay out an idea here at the beginning that in spite of the, if we look at authority in the world, if we look at authority in the church, if we look at authority in the home, there's, vast, there's a vast case study of abuse in the name of those things. And that's really discomforting to me. It's really disturbing. It's disturbing the way that, that the crusades are disturbing. It's disturbing in the way that when I talk about Christianity in my culture, people think of Republican warmongering. It's that kind of disturbing. And I want to I wanna shout and I want to yell and I want to stand on a, uh, on a tabletop somewhere and say, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I mean. But oftentimes people just say, yeah, sure. Sure, buddy. But there's a case to be made for the value of Christianity in the world. There's a case to be made for authority in the world. What I would like to say is that when we look at the Bible, at how it talks about authority, and particularly in the New Testament, how Jesus interacts with the issue of authority, in all the cases I looked at in studying for this, in all the cases I looked at that are talking about authority, the appeal is to being able to see God behind the scenes. I would actually use that as a functional definition for how to view authority. The capacity to see God behind the scenes. And I'll, I'll try to justify that position. Let's start with a couple of texts. Let's look at Jude. Chap uh, there's only one chapter in Jude, but let's start in Jude. In verse 8. This is such a fascinating story. Jude is such an interesting book. For as short as it is, it says here, let's go back to five. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. 
even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Verse 8, Likewise also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Verse 9, Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally is brute beasts, and those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and run greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perish in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves with fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now this text in particular is one that would grab a hold of me when I would consider God's view of authority in the world. Because that's a really, really bad condemnation. And it starts with the description of these people who despise dominions and authorities. And I, I had to interact with the fact that I, I did despise dominion and authority. I despised dominion and authority. I hated to be told what to do. I hated people being, having some place over me to tell me what was expected. I hated it. And I've changed a lot of things. God's changed a lot of things, and I've changed some other things in my life, but this is one place that I still find myself struggling sometimes. And there's, there's a lot to unpack there. Of historical curiosity, this story seems to be recorded in what fragments we have left of the Assumption of Moses. Where there's a dispute about the body of Moses. Not sure why. I have my ideas, but I'm not sure why. But in this, in this dispute, the archangel himself won't represent his own authority to rebuke the devil. He sees himself as an emissary of God. He isn't there on his own terms. He's there for God. Angel is the messengers, the sent ones. They're coming from God. They don't have a place to be on their own. In fact, that may be a way of distinguishing the fallen angels from God's angels, is that the ones that went out on their own. And so the archangel in this dispute this happens, there's a similar situation that happens in, in Daniel as well. These conflicts of supernatural powers are happening and on God's side of that equation, they're appealing not to their own source, to their own self, to their own might and to their own power, but the archangel himself, who knows how powerful of a being that is, is referring his authority back to God. The Lord rebuke you. He's in a fight with the devil himself, and appeals to God and not, him, not his own self. And in, this is what I'm talking about in these cases of authority. What authority is, is seeing what's behind. Seeing what God's doing behind this, this curtain, this reality. Look here at um, Matthew chapter 8. Flip over there with me. We're going to start in verse 5, I think. Yeah, and when Jesus entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed, for I am a man under authority, 
having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And, the, and his servant was healed in the same, selfsame hour. Do you see the principle of what's behind that there's the, the, the thing that causes Jesus to marvel, the co- thing that causes Jesus to be astounded and amazed is that this Gentile man, this occupier, this outsider, this rabble from the Jewish perspective can see in Jesus what everyone else of his brethren is missing. He's there as the promised one, their Messiah. He's there for their needs. He's not come but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And there he is in Israel being rejected time and time again. Nobody can see who he really is. And no matter how many times he tells them, it's only the smallest few that can see through the the blur, see through the veil of what looks on the outside and see what's behind Jesus. And this Gentile comes out of nowhere and says, listen, I know. know I know what's behind you I know who you are I can see exactly my tiny little position of authority and I say go and they go and I say come and they come you don't have to come just say the word I know who you are and his recognition of what's behind the scene it, it even surprises Jesus These places where Jesus is surprised by people are things that I pay a lot of attention to. It's just about 10 verses later in the storm of the Sea of Galilee happens and he, tells his, he, call, he says to his own disciples, O ye of little faith. Here is a centurion. He says, such great faith I've not seen in all Israel. Ten verses later, his own inner set, his own disciples, he's saying to them, O ye of little faith, because they're they're moved by the storm. They can't see what the centurion just pointed out. They can't see that he's the master of the wind and the sea. They can't see that he's the Lord of creation. They can't see what power and authority he has. They can't see what God is doing in their midst. I want to take a quick glance at at each of these domains of authority. I want to look at Ephesians. Do you... Does the language about husbands and wives make you a little uncomfortable in the Bible? It's a rhetorical question, you don't have to answer it, but I'm just putting it out there. They're pretty emphatic statements. Like like the same way that it disturbs me when Jesus says, if two of you agree touching anything and ask in my name, it should be done unto you. Like that's a really big statement to get your teeth around. There's a lot of things like that, and, 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 and one of those places that really feels big, like a, a big thing, a big claim to stake, is how the Bible talks about husbands and wives. There's a lot staked in these comments, and if we look at Ephesians chapter 5, there's other places, you know, that we can look, but here they're written out together. It says, wives submit unto your, unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. And there's something that feels scary about that to me. Like that seems like a lot of authority to wield. It seems like a lot to have vested in somebody. I can see tons of room for the misapplication, misuse, 
and abuse of those few syllables right there written by an apostle. No, 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 let me correct that. I have seen lots and lots of abuse from those few syllables from this, from this passage. I've told, I've told quite a few of you, uh, I'm sorry to be so personal tonight, but I've, I've told a lot of you um, who know me well know that when I, when I was in Oregon, the first church that I started as a young man, I started with a man who was my very best friend. Uh, we would spend 68 hours a week together. If I said we are going somewhere, people in my life at that time assumed it was me and this man, not me and my wife. We spent so much time together. He taught me my trade. We worked in my, when I left the factory because I needed a trade to teach my sons because I was going to have a family someday. I mean, I wanted to have a big family. And I didn't want to work in a factory. I needed a trade. So this man taught me my trade. We started our first church together. We prayed together. We preached together. We street preached together. We were in all kinds of situations together. Our children were born right beside each other. Boom, boom, boom. And in the years before I left my church, he, things got way out of control in his home and he was abusing his family. And it reached a climax and everything blew apart. And I remember looking back at the time before that and we were so young, like we had no business doing what we were doing, but I look back at that time and we were preaching and trying to do church work and all this stuff. And I remember, ta I remember all these times when I had read these verses and now I'm looking back and thinking about how that was used against these people, how these scriptures were used to crush people. And it just gives me this kind of like sense of fear when I approach to these things. They weren't the last. It seems like in, in, in a lot of the evangelical world, in a lot of Christianity, these, these texts have been washed away because of their, the discomfort that they create and we just kind of move on. They're not that... They're not, they're not addressed that seriously. But among those of us, among our kind of people who still look at these things and want to live by them, we have just as many cases of it going wrong as it going well. So what do we do with submit to your husbands as unto the Lord? For the husband's the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. And here's the resolution that I've come to. This, this passage, it harkens back to 1 Corinthians, right? That's where there's this other example of headship and order. And order means like coming, like it means a couple things, right? Order means like not a mess, not the opposite of chaos. So that's one sense in which order is used. But the other sense in which it's used is like, uh, 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 an ordering, a listing, a coming in order, one, two, three, four. And both of those are appealed to in Corinthians. And what, what I where I found hope and help in understanding how we should be approaching these things is that what it means that you have to look at both sides of this analogy. If a wife is supposed to submit to a husband as unto the Lord, then we have to look at what it's like for the Lord. Like we have to look at the headship order and what it means for Christ to be under the Father and for man to be under Christ and for woman to be under man. That has to run in both directions. So is, is there threat of Christ being mistreated and abused and used by the Father? No. Have we ever been mistreated, abused, and used by Christ? No, like it's literally impossible. It literally cannot happen. That's what's being appealed to. And where that isn't in place, then that's not what God's talking about. Where it's not creating order and health and life, it's not what God's referring to. 
And so we can take all of those cases of abuse and we can say, we can call it what it is, a monstrosity and a perversion. It's a perversion. And put authority back in the place where it's supposed to be. I've spoken a lot. I had the, I had the really good opportunity to give a series of meetings on just this issue out in Antrim. They're, they're up now if, if you want to look at this issue in depth. I'm not going to belabor the point here, but there's a lot of material there where I talk about exactly this principle in length if, if you're interested in those meetings from Antrim. Uh, no small thanks to David Eicher for setting those meetings up for me. I was glad to be there. So I'm not going to dig deep into this. But I will say this, if we're looking at this, I, I really think that we need to reground our sense of authority in the home, in this marriage, Christ in the church, husband and wife analogy and what's happening there so that we can understand it and that it can do in all of us what God is trying to do. That it can order the world and make things stable and holy and righteous. And, and the, the, the place that I go to time and again when I talk about this, and when I talk about it with people who are in conflict and in strife, the place that I go to is the Garden of Eden. Here's a, a working construct for why I think that this authority exists. What happens in the Garden of Gethsemane, did I say Garden of Eden? I'm in Gar Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the Lord prays, not my will, but thine be done. What that means, it begs a lot of questions. It begs the question, whose will is what? In other words, there are two wills present in the Garden of Gethsemane, the will of the Father and the will of Jesus as a man. Those two wills are in conflict. Now, those two wills are the wills of equals, right? The statement about Jesus and him being the image of the Godhead bodily is that he's the only one that it's not robbery to consider equal with God. It was not robbery for him to be considered equal with God. So you have an equal to God in the garden with two different wills present. And the way that that, the way that, that potential conflict is resolved in the garden with two wills among equals is that there's an order. And Jesus recognizes and yields his place as being under order of the Father. Under the order of the Father. And I began to think, I have begun to think over the last long while as I've been meditating on these things, that this is how we should think of how to resolve conflict in a home. That we shouldn't, I, if, if, if all that Jesus is doing is walking around in conflict with the Father's will, and he's always having to figure out how to, how to yield and how to lay down and how to, he wouldn't have been able to do any of the things he's done. But here we find this unique, abnormal circumstance where there's two wills present and it's hard to resolve this conflict. And in that place, authority steps in and says, we have a way to go forward. Notice that. And notice also that there's no coercion, no force, no power. The one under authority chooses to yield. Jesus says, with no coercion, with no authority, I mean, with no power exerted over him, not my will, but thine be done. And there's a way in a conflict between equals to keep going forward. And I think this is part of what this is about. Part of why there's a headship order. It's important to remember they're equals. There's yielding, not force. It was an abnormal circumstance. And as a part of the story, angels, literally an angel comes to minister to Christ in that conflict. There's help poured in from, from the father's side of the equation. Okay, so that's a, that's a working theory for how to view authority in the home. Let's look at Romans chapter 13 and we'll, we'll examine how differently authority in the world works. For many of us, Romans 13 
was notable because when we began to when we began to study and 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 work through non-resistance, there's there's an apparent conflict between what's happening in Romans 13 and what's happening in the Sermon on the Mount. There's an apparent contradiction between God ordaining ministers with swords to exact vengeance and judgment and the command to disciples in the Sermon on the Mount to not do those things. So how do we reconcile those two, those two issues that God has, those two ways that God has? Let's read in Romans 13 and verse 1. <clears throat> Let every soul be subject, every soul be subject to the higher powers. For there's no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. This is just right. Like Jude shouldn't surprise us if we've read Romans 13. Like those two things go right together. Despising dominion and authority and power and the way that Romans is talking about this, it's lining right up. Because what's behind all the power? What's behind all the power is God. He has a way that he's working in the world. It's what's behind. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Not problems, not difficulty, not jail time, not fines, not sentences. They that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay you tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another. I, um, I want to I wanna try to do a quick summary of this. We've talked about it many times, and so, uh, but I want to run through quickly. My working framework for how we understand the existing powers as being ordained from God. Like, so if they come from God, why is God not responsible for the terrible things they do? Why isn't God, if, if the policeman on George Floyd's neck is from God, why isn't God responsible for George Floyd's death? This is the, this is... A, a zoomed in version of the question that we all wrestle with Romans 13. And here's how, here's how I understand it. Uh, another way to say it. How are, the, how are these ordained authorities not a terror to good work when they literally cut off the head of the person who wrote that they are not a terror to good works? It seems pretty terrifying. It seems pretty terrible. The way that I understand what God's doing with authority in the world is he's keeping order in a world that's broken. That's, that's the long and the short of it. That unregenerate man needs some system to keep the world from descending into chaos, to keep us from, go, from becoming warring feudal chieftains where whoever can muster the most might can have the most power in order to have some other way of the world being there are governments ordained by God to hold the world in order. And the currency of that world, the currency of that power, is force, coercion. They bear not the sword in vain. In other words, the punchline of governing authority is do this or else. Do this or else. Don't, here's how I understand it. Because the problem with this, the problem with this analysis in Romans 13, whenever you talk to somebody about Romans 13, the place to begin is with Nero. This, whatever's happening here, has to apply to Nero. And it has to apply to Pharaoh, and it has to apply to Pol Pot, and 
uh, uh, Saddam Hussein and George Bush and Ronald Reagan and Vladimir Putin and every, because all of those authorities are existing authorities. They all are authorities in the world. And so how does this apply to all of them? How are all of those good and bad people under the same, under the same consideration? Here's the way. Whether you're in Pharaoh's Egypt or Saddam's Iraq or Putin's Russia or Biden's America, there are some universal things that are true. You can't indiscriminately kill people. You can't go crazy. You, you have to do what you say in a contract. You can't steal from the market. You, you, you can and can't do certain things in all of those systems. If we go to North Korea, you're not allowed to steal from the market. You're not allowed to murder your neighbor. It doesn't matter how bad of a regime you want to consider, these are universally true of all existing authorities. Because the existing authority doesn't produce, it's not a producer, it doesn't do anything but keep order. So it lives off of the society. In other words, it taxes. That's why custom to whom custom is due, tribute to whom, those are all like basically monetary values. You basically pay for this service is the way it works. Always has. That's what taxes are about. Paying for the service of governance. And in all those places, in all those cases, for all of human history, taxes have been levied to keep order. Now, the, the governing authority has an incentive built in to make that order stable and productive. And this is why there's like, a, there's like a balance to human history. It has revolutions and upsets, but as soon as a revolution happens, then another power comes into place. And one gets toppled and another comes into place. And the places in between the powers, the places of the revolution, the places of the Civil War, the place, these are the most destructive places for society. I've talked to, I've had, I've had the opportunity to make a few friends who are Iraqis here, and I always ask, I used to, always ask my Iraqi friends, what do you think about, this, about the situation in Iraq? Do you think it was better with Saddam, or is it worse with Saddam? Is it, was, what's worse, the Civil War that happened, or the Ba'athist regime? And I think every one of them has said Saddam was bad, but the Civil War was worse. And maybe if you're a Kurd, you would have a different analysis, but in the big picture, it looks that way. That a bad order is better than a good disorder. The French Revolution is another, the American Revolution is another. The, these revolutions that happen are the bloodiest, most horrible times in any society's life. And the goal of, is to get through that and to create a new set of order, and it, it always happens. So a new order is created, and the new order does the same things the old order did, just with some different parameters. They still keep the market safe. They still keep, your neighbor, keep you safe from your neighbor. They still stop crime. They still do all those things. And so God ordains it so that there are these orders in place so that the world holds together, so that humans do not become animals, so that we don't just tear each other to pieces. And this is a necessary thing. And this is what, I won't go, uh, this is an important thing for the world to be. Because see, if it wasn't for this case, if I didn't understand these things, if I, if I didn't have specific examples from Jesus, it would be very hard for me to pay my taxes, right? If I consider what, my, what, what some of the things that my government does that I find morally and religiously objectionable, like prosecuting wars, it would be very easy for me to justify some kind of rebellion against the established power. But when I understand this is how God, okay, so when I understand Jesus said do that, okay, well, there's, that's where we start pay our taxes. And then we can understand this is serving a purpose in the world. It's keeping order. It's making the world continue to go on so that the church can do her work. That's really our understanding. This order is preserved so that the church can continue to do her work. And at certain times and certain places, the church has been underneath the oppression of that 
existing order. And she's been persecuted and she's been driven into caves and hollows. But the order continues to exist. And at other times, like in our current time, we can live above that order. We can live within it. Like it's not coming after us. It's not going to, we don't have to worry that somebody's going to break in the door and, t- and chase us all into jail, whatever the case may be. We happen to have the ability to operate within this order without fear. But if that changes, the order still goes on. Do you see what I'm talking about? That's a way to understand order. But now here's the next important point. Jesus himself distinguishes this order from what happens among his people. You know how they that exercise authority among the Gentiles, all the things that they do, but it shall not be so among you. That is a prohibition. You are not allowed to employ those methods in my system. That's a different structure with a different purpose. And we can understand that the way that the church works as a society is mutually exclusive with the way that authority works in the world. In other words, where the one begins, the other by definition ends. So if the currency of the established order in the world is coercion and power and punishment to control, wherever those things are present, you, have, you are not in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, it's like the Garden of Gethsemane. Where there's authority at work, it's authority that's yielded to and chosen to follow. There's no coercion on this side of the equation. Wherever coercion begins, the kingdom ends. You see Jesus doing this all throughout his ministry. There's no force. He lays out his teachings. He, he gives his hard sayings in John. And he says, will you leave me also? Like there's no like... There's no force. There's no club. There's no baton. There's no way to make them do what he says. There's, Jesus never employs a you have to do this. It's always left to a choice. So let's talk about the church. M- my own religious background is... My grandfather was one of the early school of the fundamental independent Baptists. Doesn't mean much to anybody else, but uh, this movement happened within the American Baptists. There was two main denominations of Baptists. There was American Baptists and Southern Baptists. And all the Baptist churches in America were in one of those, were in one of those camps. And in the 50s, there was a group of preachers who started saying, I don't like how those groups are going. We should, we should start to have an independent movement of churches where each church is on its own, where each church does its own thing, where each church is a separate entity. And they can make free will associations among themselves, but there's no denominational structure that's forcing them to hold to certain lines. Every church chooses for themselves. This is known as the Independent Fundamental Baptist Movement. It started in the early 50s. One of the famous men who was responsible for that was J. Frank Norris. What I, because of my own personal family history, my father went to J. Frank Norris's school for the beginning of his seminary, and then he went to another school to finish, because J. Frank Norris and the man who he was working with, J. Frank Norris was, uh, I feel like this is way too much history, Baptist history for you people, but J. Frank Norris was responsible for the two biggest Baptist churches in America, an enormous church in Dallas and an enormous church in Detroit, Michigan. And he was the pastor over both of them. And he had a co-pastor in Detroit named G.V. G. Vick. And he was responsible for my, father, my grandfather's conversion. And my grandfather and all my Italian family, my great aunts and my great uncles, were born again at this Baptist church in Detroit. And they became Baptists. So I was looking into this movement. I, I've always been curious about it. I, I have all kinds of stories and family history about it. But I began looking recently There was two famous, there still are, two famous, large, fundamental, independent Baptist seminary schools in America. One is called Hiles Anderson in Hammond, Indiana, and the other is Bob Jones. These are two still very big seminaries for the independent fundamental Baptists. My family 
in California, one of my family's closest friends in California, was the first wife of Jack Hiles' son from Hiles Anderson. His name was David Hiles. And David Hiles and his father Jack were wicked, evil, monstrous men. Horrific men. Literally monsters. Abusing women, all kinds of abuse of authority, all kinds of abuse of power. And there was a there was a epidemic that came out of Hiles Anderson of abusive pastors, child abuse, abusing women, abusing authority, abusing all kinds of it was just horrific. There's a com, there's a accusation of the Reformation that's often leveled by especially high churches. It sadly has a lot of merit that says that during the Reformation there was an exchange of one pope for millions. And no organization demonstrates that better than the independent fundamental Baptist movement. There was all kinds of railing against the pope for the institution of a pope in every church, where there was this notion of the man of God, the preacher, who had some kind of demigod status. He couldn't be questioned. He had to be obeyed unflinchingly, unquestioningly. And this was an institutional problem. It happened throughout the whole institution. I, I'm not going to say that every single independent fundamental Baptist church from Hammond that came from Hiles Anderson was practicing this kind of abuse, but I can say they were all taught this kind of abuse. And I've watched, I've looked, I, 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 it's just I get on these weird little rabbit trails, and for the last long while I've been on a rabbit trail about the the history of the fundamental independent Baptist churches. And there is such a chain of horror across these churches and these men. And I've listened to their sermons and I've watched them and I've read their writings and, and I've seen again and again this pattern of abuse of authority. And just like my experiences with how the home has been abused with these horrendous views, this horrendous way of looking at these texts and, and trotting on top of women and children and people. The same has happened in all kinds of church settings. And for every one of these stories I have, I know of Mennonite brothers and sisters who have, and Amish brothers and sisters who have some bishop back home that they grew up on, the same kind of maniacal authority monger that Jack Hiles was. Why is this, where am I going with this? So now I'm here, right? The reluctant anarchist standing in a pulpit, working in the church, trying to build churches, trying to plant churches, trying to lead churches. And I'm always asking myself, how, how did those people get into that place? What is the shift that happens in your thinking when you begin to employ those mechanisms, when you begin to bring the world into the church, when you begin to use by hook or by crook, by manipulation, by intimidation, by power, by flagrant abuse of power, where you make a place for yourself in God's kingdom. And that's much, much worse than the, the horrendous things that politicians do in the abuses of their power. Because we at least know that that system's broken from, from hook to crook, from beginning to end. But this is supposed to be different. This is the place where Jesus says, it shall not be so among you. And so, I bring all of that context in when I turn my Bible to Hebrews 13. What's it saying, Hebrews 13? It's a really beautiful chapter. You know, it's kind of this ending. I really love the way that Paul ends his life. I'm going to assume the Pauline authorship of Hebrews here, but 
when, when the apostles end their epistles and they just like, they have to throw all this stuff in before they go. Like it's the last like, oh, I forgot this, this, and that. And this is kind of the, this has that kind of notion to it. In chapter 13 of Hebrews it says, let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I'll not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever, be not carried away with diverse and strange doctrines, for it's a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. He goes on to say, we have an altar about the blood. Go therefore and without the camp, and Jesus is sacrificed outside the camp. In verse uh, 15, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that's unprofitable for you. Pray for us. For we trust that we have good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. But I beseech you the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. So I read all that with all of my history, with all of my context, for all the abuse that I've seen happen. And I say, how are we supposed to do that? Well, I think just like the passages about husbands and wives, there's a key to understanding these things. The key to understanding is that that same principle, all the authority that happens in the kingdom, we should look at like, like what happens at the Garden of Eden. That where there's a conflict that happens, there's a way to yield for the people of God to keep moving forward, just after the example of Jesus, whether that's in a home or in the church, that there's a path to go forward. But my, my, my hope for all of us for all of God's people, is that if we look at, like if you, if you go to uh, Peter, right? There's another passage about, about how the home is organized and authority works in it. And he appeals to Sarah, the old women of old, likewise Sarah, who believing in God, it says, she said these things to Abraham. It's really important to me that, that those clauses are in place. Sarah's confidence is in God. What she's seeing is what's behind the scene. What she's seeing is who she's trusting. And I want to, where I interact with authority in my life, I want to see what God's doing behind the scenes. I want to have trust and confidence in the way that God's ordering the world. That, that my faithfulness, uh, let, me, let me add a little bit because I feel like I'm, I'm glossing over a point here. When I, when I left the Fundamental Independent Baptist myself, I went into charity. And in the charity movement, which is, you know, an Anabaptist revivalist movement, the big, the big kind of like claim to fame for the charity movement was we don't have standards. We don't have standards. We don't have rule standards. Like you can, I can go to the local Mennonite church, my Mennonite church back in Oregon, and I can say, show me your standards. If I want to join the church, show me the standards. So I can read through the book and I say, well, this, I, gotta, I gotta do this, and I gotta do that, and I gotta wear this, and I can't do this, and I can't do that. Well, charity said, we don't have that. We don't want that. We're not gonna do that. Well, what are you gonna do? Well, they replaced it with authority. So now I've left the Independent Fundamental Baptist and I come over to Charity, this Anabaptist Revivalist movement, and I spend some time over here and I learn what they're saying. And what they're saying is surprisingly similar to what the Independent Fundamental Baptists were saying. Because, by and large, two reasons, Danny Keniston, who I love, who is a hero of mine, also happens to be a graduate of Hiles Anderson. 
and a fan of Bill Gothard. If those names don't mean anything to you, that's fine. But the, these are places where this view of authority is taught, where you're just supposed to do what you're supposed to do. All you're supposed to do is obey the chain of command above you. It's a very militaristic way of viewing authority, that you just obey the command, you just do whatever you're told, and if it's not your responsibility, so like if you're under, under someone's authority and they tell you to do something that's unwise or bad or unrighteous, you just do what you're told and the, the responsibility for that action goes on to the authority above you. This is a horrendous way to view authority. It's a monstrosity. It creates so many bad things. It's horrible. That is not the way that authority works. You, can't, you cannot defer responsibility for your actions to someone else. I don't care who they are. If you do something wrong, you're responsible for it. That's how accountability works. You can't defer bad decisions to somebody else. You have to decide. If, something, if you know something is wrong to do, it doesn't matter who tells you to do it, you have to, you have to not do it. So I watched how all that played out. And I'm like, well, that's not it either. So what is it? In Hebrews, it says that we should follow their faith. And we should look at the end of their life. We should look at their, what's coming out of them. What's their conversation? What's their way of life? How, for those of us that are under, under authority in the church, the men that are leading, what are they producing? The other, there's a lot of other things that's taught about church authority. It says, know them that labor among you. See what their lives are like. See what, what's manifesting out of them. This is why we're not quick to lay hands on people. This is why we're slow. This is why... One of, the, one of the things we've staked a flag on and as a group of churches for how we ordain people and how we look at authority is that there's, there's proof of concept. There's an exercising of the gifts for the ministries. We do not create ministers. We do not create deacons or bishops or church planters by laying hands on them. So if we have an ordination, these people, they come up onto the stage and they weren't deacons, they had, they had no deaconess in them before and we lay hands on them and they walk off the stage and now they're deacons. We have men who we walk up on this stage and they had no bishoply quality. They weren't elders before and we lay hands on them and it's like, an, it's like a Christian incantation and abracadabra they become bishops. That's not how this works. We see people who do the work and we recognize it, and we put it in order. And that's a much more trustworthy thing to follow. They're people who are known. They're qualities who are observed. And we know what, what some of the outcomes in their lives are. I said that I was going to ask some questions here. How do we want this? We, we're going to talk about some of these things in our upcoming brothers meeting, and I, I want to, in part, to, to have this conversation and to put this in all of our minds as we talk about what does accountability for authority mean? What are the structures that should be in place so that, so that uh, one way I've been thinking about it and talking about it lately is that there's something, um, there's something really compelling about the American governance institution. And what I mean by that is that the separation of powers is pretty remarkable. Like the threefold separation of power in the American government structure is really an impressive structure. The fact that you have, if you remember back to your government class, you have the, the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. And all of them have a separation of power. All of them have something to do with the other. So the legislative branch makes laws, and the executive branch enforces laws, and the judicial branch judges laws. It's all about laws, but they have a different power over each other. And it's separated, like this is your category, and this is your category, and this is your category. Well, that's pretty smart, right? Like it doesn't all culminate in one place. The, our old systems of kings were much more unilateral. 
what's that look like for us? There's some things that we'll look at that I think in, in our brothers' meeting in Acts that I think give us some good indications of how we can view church authority, not as a pyramid, but as a circle, that we have our own kind of cyclical way. Like there's a, there's a sharing of authority. There's a, way, there's a way to intervene and to challenge and to ask questions about people that we don't have to be in just a rigid pyramid. And we'll, we'll talk about that more. Maybe you can think about it as we come up to that meeting in two weeks. But I want to have a circular way of viewing authority. We have a few categories, right? We have, we have church planters who are in an apostolic ministry. We have elders or bishops who are over the local church. And we have de- deacons who are the servants of those churches. Those are three categories of ministry. How do we create that circle of authority where there's a way to balance powers and to ask questions and to keep everything balanced? That's what we want. How should that work? <clears throat> Well, we know it has to be consensual, right? It has to be voluntary. It has to be willing, not forced or coerced. We don't want coercive measures in the church. I think that um, I'm at an hour. I think that we've 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 come through some choppy waters this last summer. And I think that there's still lingering, I think, I know that there's still lingering results from that. I know that there's still tension in the air. And I don't like it. You know what I like? I like coming here and feeling like everybody in this room wants to worship God and be as faithful as they can. I believe that. I really believe that. I believe that these are my people. I believe that this is my place. I believe that we're a family, an extended family now in different congregations, but a family nonetheless. And I also believe that we're, we're, we're struggling with some trust issues. Have you ever had trust issues in your home growing up? Have you ever had trust issues in your marriage where you're skeptical of each other, where things aren't flowing right? It's a really crummy place to live. It's hard to get stuff done. It's hard to be effective. It's hard to do the things that you're supposed to do when we don't trust each other. And so we need to, we need to work together as a family to resolve that, to be at peace. So we, because here's the thing. We can't ignore anything that's, that, that is going on with us. We dare not. But we also need to remember that we are here for a reason. We do have a job to do. We, we, we do have a job to do. There's a reason that this meeting exists. There's a reason that this family exists. There's a reason that we are here at this time in this place. And when I look across this room and I see all of the individual pieces that God has arrayed in his church at this place at this time, it's really astounding. And it's really beautiful. And I want to remember that as we talk about how to create balance and health and moving forward. I'm saying this in part tonight, not because I have answers to all of these questions, because I want you all to know we're not afraid to ask them. I don't, I'm not trying to hide this conversation behind closed doors. That's the worst thing you can do when things aren't, when things aren't operating really well. The worst thing is just try to pretend like it's not there and go on. We're not afraid of having these conversations. We want to have these conversations. We want to have them in healthy, productive, faithful ways. Faithful to the scriptures, faithful to each other, and faithful to seeing what God's doing behind all of us. All that's an encouragement to pray. All of us, brothers and sisters, pray for this meeting that we have coming up, uh, our next brothers' meeting, so that we can start resolving some of these issues and find a place to be Uh, to think about how to go forward and how to put systems in place that we can do all this well. Okay, I'm going to close there. I'm going to pray, and then maybe we can close with a song. You you ready for a song? Okay, well, let's, let's pray together, and we'll close with a song. Heavenly Father, as we've talked about all these things and looked at the scriptures tonight, what we want to confess together is that you are the real power and authority. 
you're behind everything that's happening. You're the unseen and ever-present. Father, in this room tonight, we all want to yield ourselves to your authority. We want to see you at work in our lives, in our homes, in our church, in the world around us, in the institutions of government. We want to pray for the people that you've ordained to be in charge of these things. We pray for governors and principalities, for rulers in this world. And we pray that you'd help us to understand in our homes, in our family relationship and in the church, help us understand how to see and use and observe authority. We marvel with Jesus at the, at the man who can see that Jesus is too great to be in his home and that he needs to just speak the word. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that he would be in his proper place as the head of our church. That he would be the source, that Jesus himself would be the source of what's happening among us. That all of us would bow our knee to him and follow him and serve him with every ounce of our possession, energy, strength, and heart. We bless you, Father, and we thank you for our place in your kingdom and at your table. We ask for your wisdom and your grace and that we could be faithful to everything you're calling us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.